Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, Phil said, well, people, the devil's beaten his wife today. <laughs> what? Robert teaches English. I just finished my interview with Elise Bruce, the creator of Idiomation, and she was able to share five of her favorite idioms and the history behind them. Here's the interview for you. As I mentioned in my messages, I've recently been making these idiom videos, and I've got a lot of students who are really into learning new idioms in English, but I thought it would be cool to not only teach them the meaning, but also why we use those words and look at the etymology. And I was trying to find a good resource for that, and I ran across your website, Idiomation, and also found that you had books. So I'd love to hear how you started that website and just the story behind it. Yeah, sure. Um, Back in the fall of 2009, my son started high school and uh, my son is diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder and uh, my senior gravis. But the autism is what causes him to be a very literal thinker. So by the time January 2010 hit, he was very frustrated and very worried about the fact that people at school would say things And he didn't really understand what they meant. And none of us likes to feel stupid. None of us likes to feel like we're out of the loop. And so he was saying, Mom, when they say an idiom, and I don't understand it's an idiom, my problem is that I look stupid because I don't know what they're trying to tell me. And so not wanting to embarrass him because he was in high school. I decided what I would do was if he would send me the idiom by messenger that I would then quickly tell him what it meant so he wouldn't feel so bad. Well, that was a great idea, except then he would say to me, "Okay, but mom, why do you say that? How come how come that's what they say? Why not just say what they mean? And I started to say, "Okay, well, when you ask me, I'll give you the meaning and I will look up. Uh, why they say that. So by the time that I did that, of course, I had 18 whole hits in January 2010, and all of them were from my son. At that point, he came to me and he said, Mom, can I let some of my other friends that have trouble with idioms also ask you questions and you could put it up on, on your website? And I said, sure, honey, no problem. And from there, it just grew and grew and grew. And it didn't take very long before I was doing a lot of research and having a lot of fun finding out the history behind a lot of the idioms that even I use. Such a cool story, um, which I mentioned in my message as well. I I looked at the brief um, introduction that you have on your website, sort of going through that story as well. And it's cool to hear it straight from you. Um, something that I'm curious about, you've mentioned to me that you don't feel very comfortable with technology, but you run a website. Do you (laughs) think that's an interesting coincidence? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I tell people I'm a techno gadgetry dinosaur and I really, really am. I mean, I don't even have a cell phone. So how silly is that in this day and age? However, People want to be able to access information quickly. And if I didn't learn what needed to be done in order to have the website in place, my son would have suffered because there's no way that at school that they would have allowed him to phone me every day at least once or twice saying, Mom, what does this mean? So <laughs> it, was a way, it was a way to, to help him out and then you know, people around the world don't have to phone me directly and say, hi, Elise, what does this mean? Yeah, I see how that could get overwhelming. And you're right, they probably wouldn't allow that. Well, it's really cool that you stepped up to the plate and took on that challenge. And, you know, the website looks great and everything. And it's very easy to navigate. So whatever you're doing, it's working, obviously. Well, good. I I took a lot of the uh more traditional ways of doing a book and actually just applied it to the website. And that's why there's actually an A to Z directory that you can click on and go through and see if the idiom has been researched. And if it hasn't, it's just send me a message on the, on the contact link and I will look it up, do all the research, put it up, and you get to be listed as a friend of idiomation. Ooh, um, I had a question 
I didn't, I don't know if I was uh, not searching correctly, but I wasn't able to find rule of thumb in there. Have you done one on rule of thumb? I don't believe I have. Okay. Because that well, was guess... one that looks pretty interesting to me because there's some, um, there's like some folklore going on where a lot of people think it means something it doesn't. So that might be an interesting one for you. Well, there's a, there's a lot of incorrect urban legend information about rule of thumb. So rather than spoil it for you, I actually will do all the research and put it up. Yeah, I don't want to spoil it for anybody either. I'll let you do it. Um, but yeah, I ran into something similar. I just recently did a video on giving someone the cold shoulder. Um, and there's this whole story about like serving someone a cold piece of shoulder meat from an animal to try to get them to leave when they're at your house for dinner. And as it turns out, that was just something that somebody made up. And I thought that was pretty cool. Well, there's, there's a lot of interesting made up stories that actually sound legitimate, but aren't. Um, Recently, there's been a meme going around on social media that open sesame is actually open says me. And although the story sounds wonderful, it really isn't because that version, actually, the open says me is a take on a Popeye cartoon from 1937, where instead of saying open sesame, he says open says me. But the history is much, much older than that. And in fact, I should probably do an idiomation on that. Yeah, that would be cool. I, I never heard of that one before. Um, it sounds like you've got all sorts of cool stories. Speaking of which, I was hope you've got tons and tons of really awesome stories on your website um, and also in your books. But I was wondering specifically, what are five idioms that you really enjoy either the meaning of, the history of, and if you could share those with the audience, uh, I know they would love to hear about them. Okay. Um, well, one that I did recently is Dime Store Hood. And we've all heard people talk about that, the Dime Store Hood. What in the world is a Dime Store Hood? And basically, uh, it's you know a, a low-level criminal, a low-level gangster. Okay. And uh, it sounds like it's something that should come out of the 1930s, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, it, it sounds pretty it, old. It, it does, you know. I mean, when's the last time you went to a dime store? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, we have dollar stores now, and believe it or not, dollar stores are what dime stores used to be a hundred years ago. Surprise! <laughs> <laughs> so I did a lot of research, which of course involved finding out when was the first dime store actually around, because you can't have a dime store hood unless you have a dime store. And the first dime stores in America were in 1896, believe it or not. And those were the Crest stores and the Woolworth stores. But the thing is, they didn't have cheap merchandise. What they had was inexpensive merchandise. Um, Frank Woolworth, who created the Woolworth stores, decided to cut out the middleman and go directly to the supplier, directly to the manufacturer, and buy items, and then put everything out on tables for a dime or less. And that's where the dime store was. So they were quality stores. So we find that, okay, 1896 and afterwards would be when there would be a dime store hood. So then the hunt becomes, well, where did hood come from? And hood is actually a shortened version of hoodlum. Mm. And so at that point, yeah. So it's all right. When when was the first time that people were talking about hoodlums? Well, you know, you have to go back uh, a fair bit. And uh, at the turn of the previous century, newspapers were talking about gangs of young boys who were stealing, thieving from stores, and they referred to them as hoodlums. Well, that's fine, but there were no dime store hoodlums, so we had to keep on looking for hoods specifically, which took me into a lot of interesting places until I finally found the International Association of Chiefs of Police. And in a 1933 report is the first time that they re uh, refer to hoodlums as hoods, and they specifically talk about thieves being 
coins. Okay, so somewhere between 1896 and 1933, you have to start looking, where did Dime Store and Hood get connected to each other? Well, the harder that you look, the more difficult that it is. And I went through countless, countless old, old books, old newspapers. I mean, I spent hours and I have not been able to hook up Dime Store with Hood, which is interesting because they did have dime novels back then, which is a whole different entry. So the question then becomes, if Dime Store Hood, if those words were around in the 1930s and they weren't hooked up, where did they get hooked up after 1933? So hunt, hunt, hunt. And the first instance that I could find where it was written was in a Stephen King novel called The Body. Oh. That was, yeah, in 1982. So although the entry is up on, on the blog, I have told people that I've sent out a message to Stephen King's people asking them if Stephen King actually is the person who coined that phrase. Because if he is, then 1982 is the start year. If he isn't, I've also asked if he isn't, where did he hear it and when did he hear it and who did he hear it from? Oh man, <laughs> um, the movie, I, I haven't and actually read The Body, but uh, the movie Stand By Me is one of my favorites. And yeah. I'm wondering if they say it in the movie, I can't remember. That's so Yes, they do. Gordy Lachance says it in, okay. in one of the scenes with, with the uh, older teenagers that are giving them a lot of trouble at one point. Yeah. I don't want to spoil a movie for anyone who may not have seen it yet, but trust me, when Gordy Lachance says it, it's it's impactful and it's interesting. It really sticks out. Yeah, if you guys are looking to watch movies in English to improve your listening and comprehension, I highly recommend Stand By Me. It's one of my all-time favorites. Love that movie. Oh, yeah. so I'm assuming uh, Stephen King's people haven't gotten back to you yet. Not yet. Uh, it could take months before you hear back. Um, you know, I actually at one point I had done uh, an idiom uh, called uh, on cool beans because there's there's something that you hear sometimes you go, what in the world does that mean? Right. But uh, I had talked with Jerry Flowers, who uh, uh, was in Nashville and had uh, managed a lot of people. And he said he first heard it from Aaron Tippett. And so I sent a letter to Aaron Tippett. And two years later, I got a message back. This is from Aaron. I don't know where I heard it from. I used it and yeah, I used it in front of Jerry Flowers. I got no idea where I heard it. So <laughs> you really do your research. That's so cool. You're sending letters and reaching out to individuals. If Stephen King did coin it, that would be really interesting because I mean, usually these things just sort of show up I mean, obviously, someone has to say it first, but they they show up organically and you've got a lot of the population using it all of a sudden. But if you can actually trace it to an individual, have you come across any idioms like that where you actually know the person who said it first? Uh, in a lot of cases, I can trace it back to the first person who wrote it. But in most cases, they've been dead for hundreds of years. So I'll never get to know them, but but I've got proof that they're the they're the first published version of that. Very cool. Yeah, I was noticing that in your on your website. That's kind of as far back as we go. Is this is the first time we've seen it in print? Um, yes. But since Stephen King is alive, if um, if you could find out if he was the first one to write that, that would be really cool. That would be awesome. A lot of the idioms that I look up, if people don't don't ask me to look them up, I actually write them down in a little book when I hear them in movies or on television or, or if I come across them in a book that I'm reading. And uh, I mean, one of them actually I got out of a Star Trek movie, believe it or not. And that was if my grandmother had wheels, she'd be a wagon. <laughs> Which movie was it? Uh, Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. Okay, yeah. And and it's Scotty who says it, uh, and of course Scotty's got quite the delivery when he says it, which is he's very incensed about a question that was put to him, 
and 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 how the information keeps getting changed and moved around. And it's basically no different than than saying, you know, well, this is how to make macaroni and cheese, but then you're going to add ham and you, then you're going to add this and you're going to add carrots and corn. And pretty soon it's not macaroni and cheese. And so this is when it would be appropriate to say, well, if my grandmother had wheels, she'd be a wagon. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually, I mean, I've seen that movie. So that's probably the only time I've ever heard that one too. It's been a while since I've watched those movies. Yeah, well, you know, it's a, it's an interesting idiom, and it took you know a, a fair bit of hunting to find out who had said that. But it's actually uh, an idiom in English that's translated from Spanish, believe it or not, where the the Italian the Italian and Spanish uh, idiom is the same, and it's if my grandmother had wheels, she'd be a bicycle. Ah, uh, yeah, isn't that interesting? And of course. In French, they they have it as uh, avec des si et des mais on mettrait Paris en bouteille, which is with ifs and buts we could bottle Paris. Wow, <laughs> very and, cool. And, yeah, you know, and so I mean, these are the things that you 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 find put together, and you go, oh, well, that's interesting. So where did that come from? Now you would think something that old, because wagons have been around for hundreds of years. OK, and you would think that that would be a really, really, really old idiom, but it's not. It's actually a, a pretty recent one. Um, it was actually in a book and I can't I can't even say the title of it because it's in German. I'm no good at saying that, but it is on on my website. Uh, it was a book that was written by Ignaz Bernstein and B.W. Siegel and was published in Germany in 1908. And that was the first time that that idiom ever showed up published in a book. So the first time it showed up was in the German language? In German. And that's where it was written as, if my grandmother had wheels, she'd be a wagon. <laughs> yeah, the, the bicycle one, I want to say I've actually heard that from um, some Spanish-speaking students that I've known. And I didn't even make the connection. Um, to the Star Trek movie. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. I'm having fun already. <laughs> I knew this would be interesting. Oh, well, you know, and this is why you can see why it's addictive for me as a researcher to look up all of this stuff. Because oftentimes I do know what the idiom means, but I don't know what the history is. And the fun is in going back, going back, going back, and, and seeing how it's mutated from the past into the, the idiom that we use today. And in some cases, it does mutate. And in some cases, it doesn't. You know, um, like uh, when, when I first moved to, uh, to the South here, I was listening to the radio and there's a, a radio show host here on talk radio called Phil Williams. And uh, we were going through some kind of strange weather, you know, when it's raining outside, but there's sunshine, it's a nice sunshiny day, but it's raining all over the place. You know, a day like that, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Phil said, well, people, the devil's beating his wife today. <laughs> what? <laughs> Yeah, the devil's beating his wife. And I had never, ever heard that. Never in my life. Okay. So, of course, that was time for me to go and take a look at where did this come from? Could this really actually be a real idiom? Or was Phil Williams, who also is a wonderful comedian, did he just make that up so he could be funny on radio? Because he really is very funny on radio. And uh, so it took a little bit of looking, and believe it or not, I found it in a book called The Book of Woodcraft and Indian Lore uh, by Ernest Thompson Seton, published in 1922. And so it was interesting because he prefaced it with rain before seven, clear before 11, uh, fog in the morning, bright sunny day. And then he mentioned that if it was raining and sunshine, that the devil was beating his wife. And I thought, <laughs> 1922, except that was not the earliest one. Oh, and I oh. thought, oh, my Lord, are you serious? I researched all the way back 
1738. I know, 1738 of all the times. Oh, my goodness. And, yeah. And uh, believe it or not, there it was, uh, written in a book by Simon Wagstaff. Now, there's a good name, Simon Wagstaff. You had a wife that needed beating and you were a devil? <laughs> you want to have a staff. Anyhow, uh, in his book, there's two characters who are speaking, and the colonel says, it rained, and the sun shone at the same time. And then, never out, the other character says, why then, the devil was beating his wife behind the door with the shoulder of mutton. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> it was 1730. 1738. The wow. devil was beating his wife. Even back then, he was a hothead. That is hilarious. And yeah, I, I mentioned, I don't know if you saw my last message, um, but I hadn't heard of most of the ones that you mentioned, which is why I was excited because I was going to learn not only the history of these idioms, but these idioms in general. And that's one that I'm going to have to um, pull out sometime when it's happening. I live in Colorado, so we get plenty of rainy sunshine uh, in the summer. I'll have to say it to my wife. She'll get a kick out of that. <laughs> well, she'll, she'll either get a kick out of it or she'll give you a sideways <laughs> glance and say, excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> Probably a little bit of both. That's all right. You can put up your hands and say 1738. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't make that up. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So um, there were a couple of other idioms that I had suggested. and. Uh, one of them was like white on rice, and the other one is hot as a $2 pistol. So I don't know which one you'd like to find out about first. Let's start with like white on rice, because that's one that I actually know. And I'm super curious about that, because I <laughs> I mean, rice is typically white if it's not brown rice, but white mm -hmm. on rice, that always baffled me. And I would love to know where that came from. Well, genetically, rice is not white. Ta -da! And I didn't know that either until I started doing a, a lot of uh, research. But I found, according to the Public Library of Science Genetics Journal, that it has taken 10,000 years for rice to go from red rice to white rice. Yeah, I, I thought I that there were different. Um, I thought that there was brown rice and yes. maybe red rice. I thought they did something to it to turn it white. I didn't realize that we had engineered it to become white. Yeah, yeah, it's there. The white rice is actually genetically engineered to be white. And the reason that they did that uh, was because they found out that if they modified it and made it white, it cooked faster. And it cooked faster, of course, because the shell's not quite as hard as if it's a red or a brown rice, okay? Uh, when you cooked it, they also found out that white rice stays white. So that was a bonus for them. Okay. And what they found out for farmers was that if you're growing white rice, it is so super easy to find insects on your crop or to spot if there's disease on your crop so that you can actually address it before it annihilates your entire crop. So white rice, there's a reason for it, and it's not natural, but it sure is good, right? It is, yeah. <laughs> I know that I've heard that brown rice has, and red rice, you get more nutrients, I guess, from that shell. Um, sure. But it is I, healthier for you. Yes, yeah, it is. I thought that they were actually stripping the shell before they, I don't know, you know, threw the rice into to bags or whatever. I don't know much about rice, clearly. <laughs> well, but you know what? It's it's a reasonable thing to assume that that's probably how they do it. So, I mean, I was like you. I thought, well, it's got to be a processing thing. And what I found out is a genetic thing. They actually have changed what rice is like. So uh, that was interesting. See, all the little things that you learn while you're doing these research, is, it's amazing. Um, now, a lot of people are under the false impression these days that if you say like white on rice, that you are being racist towards people who 
have rice as a staple in a lot of their dishes. So, oh, you're anti-Asian. Um, no, again, that's that's because they don't understand that it's not about race. The whole expression has nothing to do with race. And in fact, the first time it was used in 1951, prior to 1951, the expression was like gravy on rice. Because what? down in the South, they put gravy on everything. They would. <laughs> <laughs> gravy on biscuits, gravy on sausage, gravy on everything. And it was gravy on rice. So up until 1951, when it first started to appear in newspaper articles as like white on rice, which they the, the people that were writing those articles felt it was easier for people in the northern states to understand white and rice than they were able to understand what gravy was doing on rice. Gravy sticks to rice, but if you have white rice like white on rice, that's the way it is organically. That's it. It's white on rice. And so when people say, you know, that it's white on rice, it means that you've got the situation covered, that it's just like rice. It's as, as ricey white as it's ever going to be. You're on top of that situation. So, okay. yeah, so when when some one of your friends says to you, have have you got that assignment completed for your students so that they, they can get it worked on? And you say, you know what? I was on it like white on rice. That means you've got it done. It's lickety split, ready to go. Very cool. The gravy yeah. on rice thing. Very interesting. It it is. Now, of course, is I that go still happening? Are people still putting gravy on rice? Because I've never had but gravy on rice. I've seen, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't go to the south very much. I've I've uh, I've been to Georgia, and that's about it. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not a great lover of putting gravy on everything, or actually, I'm not a big lover of putting gravy on anything. Uh, but yeah, there, you still see it down here, and it's actually oftentimes down in the southern states, it's an offering with your rice. Would you like gravy on that? Uh, which always throws me, but <laughs> is it typically brown gravy or like yeah. country gravy? Uh, white gravy is a is a real popular one to put on white rice. Yeah, I might have to try that. I'm going to have a lot of interesting stories to tell my wife when she gets home. Of course, I could just show her the the video when I'm done. <laughs> just sweetheart, watch this. <laughs> We're yeah. lots of cool stuff. No, she'll <laughs> definitely enjoy it. I, I have a feeling that a lot of native speakers are probably going to enjoy this particular video just because um, whether or not you are trying to learn more about the English language, this is interesting stuff. Well, the, the history behind it is just as interesting sometimes as what the idiom means. And in fact, a lot of times I go down what I call the historical rabbit hole and, and wind up coming up somewhere very far away from the idiom, but having learned a lot of history that I wouldn't have otherwise known. Speaking of mm -hmm. idioms, the, the historical rabbit hole, there's a little bonus idiom for you guys. Oh, that... <laughs> you're, you're, you're just going to be a double friends of Indiamation today, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I should do, I don't, I don't, I haven't done down the rabbit hole. I mean, Although, I'm you know, I have that my comes ideas. from Alice in Wonderland, right? Well, I would think it might come from there, but then again, it's possible that, that it didn't come from there. Lewis Carroll may have actually heard it said somewhere else. So that's why I'm very careful when some people say, oh, it must come from, mm. if I haven't done the research, I go, you know what, that's something I need to check out. Yeah, I always <sighs> assumed it, but now that I'm talking with you, it's entirely possible that it, he had heard it from someone else and he decided to just like bring it to action. Mm -hmm. Well, now you've got that one on your to-do list along with uh, the rule of thumb. So yes. you've got some work to do. Well, it's, uh, I, it's not really work, you know, because I do love doing the research. So it's a little bit of work and it's a, it's a whole lot of fun and I love discovering 
you know, things that I didn't know before. And I suppose that's because I have this love of learning and, and I like language. I love language. I think it's intriguing. So, in fact, we probably should get to hot as a $2 pistol. Bring it on, yeah. <laughs> Bring it on. So, do you have any ideas at all where hot as a $2 pistol comes from and why you would even talk about a $2 pistol? Well, I haven't heard that before. Uh, I, I won't dare to guess where it comes from, but I'll try to maybe guess the meaning. Um, okay. Is it going to be, is it going to have to do with a stolen item or is it going to have to do with something being cool or like it, popular? It, it, no, it actually, uh, when someone's hot as a $2 pistol, they are so mad that you don't even want to be anywhere close to them because they're that mad. They're just hot as a $2 pistol. Ooh. I mean, that's, that is, that is scary. Don't you think? It is scary, but, but yeah, why a $2 pistol? Why that price specifically? It's well, and isn't that interesting? You know, why, why specifically two dollars, not a five dollar pistol or or a ten dollar pistol? And it all has to do with, uh, believe it or not, pistols and when pistols did come out, okay, and when recognized brands started to hit the market. Now, back in the Wild West, they had all kinds of different guns and manufacturers. But the ones that started to really stick out were Colt in 1836, Remington in 1848, Smith and Wesson in 1857, and the Winchester in 1866. And so you had these gun manufacturers all vying for the same market. They wanted to make sure that they were going to get the lion's share of pistol buying people coming over to buy their brand. And so they would say all kinds of things that were truthful. Uh, and uh, in fact, at one point, Colt had put out a flyer that was called Simple Reasons for Preferring Colt Arms to All Others. And it listed 14 reasons why you needed to buy a Colt brand pistol instead of others. Okay. And what they had as number five was. They leave no burning paper in the barrel after discharge to block the next cartridge into your face, as do the guns which open from behind. Okay. And number seven said, they are made of the best steel that can be procured for your money and have the strength to resist the explosive force of gunpowder, while the mongrel imitations and cheap arms are clumsily made of cast iron or inferior materials and are more dangerous to their owners than they are to all other people. Yeah, so you don't want to have something that is an inferior brand pistol. So I thought, okay, let's go take a look at what were these pistols selling for back in the day. Because we're talking, you know, the 1850s, 1860s. How expensive could a pistol be? Well, the Colt Peacemaker which is called the gun that won the West, sold for $17. And $17 back then was a chunk of change. I mean, that was a lot of money. A $2 pistol, which was also available from other brands, were not well-made. And they did have a habit of blowing up in people's hands. They had a habit of blowing up in your face. They, they had a big bunch of problems with them. So you could either spend $2, have that thing blow up on you, hurt you, make you mad, make you really mad, or you could just buy a $17 pistol from Colt, use it the way you needed to use it, and be happy that you had the Colt because it did the job. Okay. That makes so, complete sense. Yeah. So uh, I think that's you know pretty darn cool. So there you go. So into the 1850s, yeah, hot as a pistol. Hot as a two-dollar pistol. Mm. Awesome. I could sit here all day and and listen to stories about uh, idioms, but you guys could also just go to idiomation.com and no, idiomation.wordpress. Oh, sorry, idiomation.wordpress.com. I'll put a 
uh, an image of the website here. Um, I had a curious question after talking with you because you were mentioning idioms that were starting as late as like the 50s and then as early as, what, 1730 something for one of them. What's the oldest idiom that you've come across? Oh, my Lord. Um, but you can remember it. You can think of off the top of your head. The, the thing is, there are a lot of idioms that I've done that date back into ancient times, ancient Rome, ancient Greece, uh, and some that even go way, way further back than that, where you're, you're looking at, at uh, tablets. <laughs> I know. Isn't that interesting? Um, and there's a lot of things that we say today that also are, are found in um, the Old Testament, either in the Bible or in the Torah, or even in some cases where, where you go back into other religious texts that are, you know, way, way, way before, you know, the whole birth of Jesus. OK, and uh you know, it's hard to say which one is the oldest because there's a number that I could choose from. Um, I mean, I know one that you've done is uh, the apple of your eye, which yeah, is yeah, goes back the Old Testament. Ever. You know, so that's that's an ancient ancient times, even before ancient Greece and ancient Rome, people were were using that as an idiom. Very cool. Well, I, I don't want to take up all of your time here, but I did want to give you a chance to um, give a shout out to the viewers here. So is there anything that you would like to let them know about as far as um, your books, your website, other projects you have going on? Um, well, we have the two idiomation books that are available on Amazon on, on all the, the platforms. Uh, and of course, idiomation.wordpress.com. Uh, I write a number of books under my name as, as Elise Bruce, but I also write a number of books as E.B. Taylor, uh, mostly because as Elise Bruce, I write a lot of idiomation and a lot of books for children. And as E.B. Taylor, it's for a more mature audience. And so they're not children friendly themes. In fact, uh, they're scarier stories. They're stories for Halloween. Um, I have a series that I've started uh, about Lane Covington, uh, who is a teenage psychopath. He doesn't kill anybody, but he certainly is a dangerous little character. I'll tell you that. Um, I'm a musician, so I have CDs out there. I'm a visual artist. I have art out there. Uh, as long as it's creative, I'm in there for, for a nickel, in there for a dime. Oh, there's another one I should look up and chalk up to you. Oh, man. <laughs> in for a nickel, in for a dime, in for a penny, in for a pound. So, you guys are getting uh, bonus idioms. I hope you appreciate it. Um, <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it sounds like we are similar in that sense. Obviously, I run this YouTube channel, and, and I love doing this. I feel the same way as you, that you know, I'm working, I'm doing it all the time, like hours and hours every week, but I love learning as I research to do my videos, because even though I have a master's degree in TESOL, um, if I'm covering a new grammar or like punctuation point that I haven't gone over in a while, oftentimes I'm learning it for the first time or learning new things about it for the first time, which is really cool. So it's been a real pleasure talking with you, Elise. Thanks so much for um, taking the time to chat with me today. Well, I really appreciate you giving me a chance to share my passion for history and language with the people that follow you, uh, your students, your friends, your fans, your followers. And uh, I, I hope that uh, we'll talk again soon. And uh, feel free to ask me to look up anything and if you have any students that are interested in uh, finding out the meaning of something, they can send along their suggestions to me again, Elise at EliseBruce.com. I'd be more than happy to look it up for them and, and give them all the information. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Okay, take care.